my shed. Well, I guess you've been lured here by uh, the title of this video, 100-year-old valve amp. How can that possibly be? Well, of course, it was uh, <clears throat> playing with the truth just a little bit, but the case for this build could indeed be a century old. And <clears throat> you'll find out more about that as we go along. Mind you, the, uh, the gubbins are new, and if the word gubbins is new to you, I suggest you look that up. It's, uh, it's a fabulous word and should be used more often. But uh, I built this little uh, single-ended amp recently. It's the smallest combo that I've built. It has a six-inch speaker, but sounds pretty good despite that. Um, if you'd like to see more about how I put it together, keep watching. Hello folks and welcome to my shed. It's a rainy day and I've decided to start on a new project. Now, that's going to be the basis of my next little single-ended uh, amp for guitar or harmonica. A little word of explanation. Uh, my woodworking skills are close to non-existent and in the past to uh, to build small amps I've looked for already made items that I can repurpose so for example this is a, a vintage wall mounted PA speaker uh, that has a an 18 watt Marshall circuit built into it and um, this in its former life was a uh, movie projector extension speaker and so oh, as we see repurposed here with uh, a little single-ended 5 watt amp built inside. I've also used vintage uh, boxes from uh, valve tape recorders and other items. So I got this for next to nothing. Some of you might uh, recognize what this is. Here's a working example. Yes it's a box from a wind-up gramophone. Now, of course, I would never deface a working example like that. But this one, when I got it, uh, had been gutted. My plan is going to be... Uh, I've got a commercially made chassis. I'm going to have to put the uh, all the holes and cutouts necessary, but that's going to go there with the controls on the other side. And I've got a Weber six-inch speaker, smooth cone, ideal for harmonica, uh, similar to what was in the very early Fender Champs. So that's the plan. So if you want to hang around and uh, see how the project progresses, stick with me. Well, there are always issues uh, with using an already built enclosure uh, for a new amp build rather than being able to manufacture a, a box uh, to exact dimensions. So I've cut a baffle from 9mm ply for the speaker and we find that there are a couple of holes um, in the, uh, the base of the box which will be the front of the amplifier. So my next task is to design a cutout that removes the, uh, the offending holes uh, but that will do the job um, and look nice. So I'll just have to see what I can come up with. Well, there we go. I've opted for uh, uh, the simplest design 
uh, that was consistent with uh, a bit of a vintage look and I've just temporarily put some old grill cloth, cloth there which um, I think I might end up using that looks quite good so that's what it's going to look like there is going to be another cutout over here uh, for the controls okay so here's the completed speaker baffle and uh, there we go you've got the mounting holes for the speaker and uh, holes for the baffle drilled through the front and the speaker cloth is attached now for an experienced cabinet builder this would probably be uh, a very short amount of work but it's taken me half the morning to do that anyway onwards to the next step well I'm now at the stage where I'm cutting out the uh, the opening in the chassis for the power transformer and I'm using that using a, a Dremel tool uh, and a cutting disc and it was going very slowly until I realized I had the uh, the Dremel tool on the slowest setting so it's uh, it's going a little bit quicker now that uh, I've got it going a bit faster I must say you have to be use a very light touch with this otherwise you'll snap the uh, the cutting discs well the cutout for the power transformer is done uh, but I realized after about 20 minutes of work that the Dremel tool with the cutting disc was going to take forever and ended up with a jigsaw with uh, a metal cutting blade which uh, sliced through the aluminium like butter. I've cut an opening using a jigsaw in the front for the control panel and next up is uh, drilling holes for the tube sockets. Fortunately the chassis is aluminium which is much easier to cut through than steel. I'm going to need a, a smaller hole for a, a seven pin miniature socket for the 6AU6 and a slightly larger hole for the 9 pin socket for the EL84. We'll get to the actual circuit a little bit later on. So my options for drilling the holes are uh, a hole saw, I've got a full set of those. My preferred option is a hole punch. These give a very nice neat hole but they're quite expensive um, so I'm not sure whether I've got the right size for that one. Another option is just to use an ordinary drill and a step drill. These will do the work, uh, but they're a little bit slower and a bit messy. The um, edges of the hole end up a bit jagged and you have to do a bit of work to smooth them up. The EL84 socket is, needs a, uh, well, it's an 18 millimeter diameter. And luckily my hole punch is for 20 millimeters so it'll just give us a millimeter clearance all the way around should do the trick nicely so I've uh, drilled a 10 millimeter guide hole this bit goes through the top and the cutting part uh, threads on around the other side we simply uh, wind this down uh, to apply pressure using a, uh, a hex key and it just slices through and does a very neat job. I'll show you the result. Well there we go, a nice neat hole with the hole punch and uh, it's fraction larger than is ideal but it'll do the job that's for the EL84 now the seven pin socket uh, is 15 millimeters across and I do have a 16 millimeter uh, 16 millimeter hole saw and I'm hoping that will uh, do the job nicely Well, the hole saw has done an adequate job, although as you can see, the edges are a little bit jagged. Um, good size for the 7mm uh, socket. I'll just have to 
tidy up and smooth off the edges. You know, you try to plan things ahead and uh, try to anticipate any roadblocks, but sometimes you get caught. Now, an EL84 would normally sit up about yay high, and uh, that would mean that uh, you could not close the back door of the amplifier. So what I've had to do is in fact arrange a situation where I can drop the, uh, the tube down low into the chassis. I'll just show you how I've done that. So here we go. I've uh, put the socket down into the chassis by using a couple of spacers. And that gives me headroom so that I will be able to close up the amplifier. Where there's a will, there's a way. So I've now drilled the holes for the controls on the control panel. Uh, I don't have a drill press and my drill bits only go up to 10 millimeters. Some of these holes are 12, 13 millimeters. And so with my um, rechargeable electric drill, I've had to use the step drill, the step bit to, uh, to go up to uh, some of the larger holes. And that's required a little bit of filing to smooth out the edges. So here are the controls mounted to make sure that everything fits. Uh, not wired in yet, obviously, but all looks good. Right, I've now drilled what I think are all the necessary holes in my chassis. And then very soon I'll be assembling all the major components and also putting most of the small components onto a tag board uh, which will be set up on offsets down there somewhere. Okay, I think it's time we looked at the circuit that's going to go into uh, our little amplifier. Um, in, the, in a way, it's very similar to a Fender Champ. It's a single-ended uh, tube circuit uh, with an output of about 5 watts. But there are some significant differences. Um, for a start, it's using an EL84 as the output rather than a 6V6. And the preamp tube is not a twin triad like the 12AX7, but it's a pentode tube. Uh, 6AU6. This has uh, a much higher gain than the 12AX7 um, but it can tend to be microphonic so sometimes you have to uh, go through a couple of uh, tubes to find the right one. Uh, they are very cheap and easy to find even though they're not current production. In the uh, late 50s early 60s they were used extensively in valve radios in Australia as a um, radio frequency amplifier. Anyway, there you see it. Um, this, I found this circuit uh, online. It was called Glowbug 58. There aren't too many circuits online using the 6AU6 as the preamp tube, although Silvertone and Dan Electro uh, did make uh, some amps in the 1960s with this kind of preamp. So the circuits are available. I've um, adjusted this one a little bit for a, for one thing. It doesn't have a tube rectifier. The circuit that I'm going to use just has a solid state rectifier. So only two tubes, the 6AU6 preamp and the EL84 or 6BQ5 as the output. Um, okay, there's a, there's a 6AU6. This is an Australian made one by Radiotron and um, so that's how they look as you can see quite different from a 12AX7. It's a good idea if you're not working from an established circuit to um, get a little bit of a layout diagram down so that you know exactly where everything is going to fit. So this is my layout diagram and all of that is going to go in there. And the first thing I'm going to start doing is populating the, um, the board with uh, all the capacitors and resistors. 
make sure everything's in the right place. Here we go. Well, the wiring of the chassis is pretty much complete. The only thing that's missing there is the pilot light. Uh, we'll do that later. And the tubes are not yet in, but we're getting very close to the point where we can plug this in and give it a try out. It's pretty snug in there. Well, I was keen to hook this up, plug it in, turn it on and see what's what, but I controlled myself and uh, did a final check tracing uh, all the wiring from the input all the way out to the speaker. And yes, I found a couple of errors. Uh, when you're doing a little bit uh, one day and then you leave it and maybe come back a couple of days later and spend another half hour, things do get forgotten. So this connection from the tone control back to the board uh, was completely missing. Put that in. And there was a connection to uh, the EL84 that I had uh, got two pins mixed up. So that uh, wouldn't have worked. So it's now time to connect something to the input, plug in a speaker, uh, and um, put it through the, uh, the Variac and the uh, limiter for safety and see what happens. Well, I thought the chassis was done. Uh, I checked everything, uh, switched on, and yes, I had sound, but the tone control didn't work. So I've completely rewired the tone control and uh, we'll see how we go. Now, I don't have a tone ge signal generator uh, to generate a tone, so I go old school, I've got a little old MP3 player, uh, just plug that to the input and the uh, plugged into the workshop speaker, turn on one hand of course and we'll see how we go. And I think you can see filaments lighting up on the EL84. Oh, yes, there we go. There we go. Okay, we have lift off. Excellent. Now when I checked the bias on the out tube, output tube, I found that it was only running at about 25% uh, dissipation, where with a single-ended amp you can go up to 100%. Um, fortunately, as you can see, the, uh, the cathode bias resistor, uh, I've placed that in a situation where I can remove it and replace it easily. It's the only way to, uh, by trial and error, work out the correct bias. So I've been reducing the value of the resistor and uh, we'll take some measurements and see how this works out. Well, after a little bit of troubleshooting, uh, finding a couple of wiring faults and changing the, uh, the tone control circuit and then by trial and error, um, changing the cathode resistor, I finally got uh, a good bias on the output tube. Uh, here are the numbers. I ended up using a, an 82 ohm cathode resistor, had a 4.3 volt uh, drop across that cathode resistor, and the um, power supply is giving us 220 volts of uh, plate to cathode voltage. Now I use the uh, the bias calculator at robrobinet.com. This, um, this website is an absolute gold mine of information and using the calculator I've ended up with a plate current of 49.5 milliamps and the plate dissipation 
The maximum plate dissipation for an EL84 is 12 watts, so it's dissipating just under that, 11 watts or 91%, and that's a good result. Well, I'm getting close to the end of uh, this little build where I'm building a uh, pretty much from the ground up a single ended amp uh, built into an old gramophone case. I wasn't too keen about the uh, silver face plate going in beside the uh, light brown or tan cloth on the speaker. So, what I've done is I've photographed the uh, the face plate and then print it up on a colored card uh, a face plate and then laminated it and so just roughly insert if I just roughly insert that I think you can see that uh, color wise that's going to look a lot better once I've attached that to the chassis I have a problem. Everything works, uh, uh, but despite careful measurements, when I've assembled everything, I find that the output transformer is rubbing against the magnet on the speaker. And I am getting some distortion in the lower frequencies. I'm going to have to relocate the transformer further up the chassis to clear the speaker. That's going to be a pain in the neck. But it has to be done. So despite what I thought was careful planning, I found that the output transformer was rubbing against the magnet of the speaker. So I've had to detach all the connections and I've moved the, tr the transformer about 30 millimeters away on the chassis and there's now a one centimeter gap between the transformer and the speaker. Let's hope that is enough. Well it looks as though the mystery of the distortion is solved. I had uh, put a coupling cap into the circuit between uh, the preamp tube and the output tube. Uh, the value was 0.047 microfarads and this would let the maximum amount of bass through. It's, uh, it's this little fella here. And uh, that was working fine when I connected the amp to the 12 inch workshop speaker. But when I hooked it up to the smaller 6 inch speaker, I was getting a lot of distortion, particularly when I hit the, uh, the lower notes. And uh, so I've swapped out the coupling capacitor for a lower value, it's a 0.02. And uh, lo and behold, the distortion seems to have disappeared. So unless I'm getting some rattling from uh, the cabinet, uh, I'm hoping we shall have clear audio. So I'll put it all back together and we'll see. Well, here it is in all its final glory, the smallest combo I have ever built with uh, two tubes and a six inch speaker. And uh, I was warned not to use a small pentode in the preamp because they're very temperamental. They tend to be microphonic and uh, pick up noises from the speakers and so forth. But, fingers crossed, I think we have a result. And I'll just uh, button up the back and, uh, and show you how it looks from the front. But as you can see, this once was in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the case for a Decker brand wind-up gramophone. Well, here it is front on, and uh, I'll just put my hand in front so that you can give it some scale. As you can see, it is quite small, but uh, it's a little dog that barks uh, quite loudly. Uh, it was meant to be carried this way with a handle at the top, but of course it is possible to stand it up to give it more of a, uh, a normal combo look. So I'm not a guitarist, but I'll, uh, I'll blow a little bit of music uh, through my harmonica uh, through the amp for you as a taste.
Thank you.